All right, interesting analysis yesterday from Nate Cohn in the New York Times of why it is that Donald Trump has consistently underperformed his polls in these primaries. Now, no one here is saying that he's not an absolute lock for the Republican nomination, that he isn't an incredibly force in the Republican Party, that he isn't probably at this point the favorite to win the general election against Joe Biden. But it's an interesting enough phenomenon that we wanted to spend some time digging into it. So put this up on the screen from the New York Times. Um, Nate Cohen says three theories for why Trump's primary results are not matching expectations. He's underperformed the polls in each of the first three contests. So first, let me give you just the data. We shared this with you yesterday, but just to refresh. So in Iowa, the final 538 polling average had Trump leading Haley by 34 points with the 53% share. Instead of beating her by 34 points, he beat her by 32 points with a lower share, 51%. Not that different, but a little bit off. In New Hampshire, in the polls, he led by 18 points with 54%. In the end, he won by 11 points with 54%. So a narrower margin than was predicted. In South Carolina, Trump led by 28 points in the polls with 62% of the vote. And he ultimately won by 20 points with 60% of the vote. So again, it's not a huge underperformance, but it is a consistent trend in the primary states that we've seen thus far. So the three explanations that Nate floats here uh, possibilities. Number one is just simply undecided voters who, you know, were telling pollsters, I don't know, going into it, ultimately broke for Nikki Haley. Um, there is some evidence uh, that this accounts for part of it, but it can't account for all of it because of the piece of Trump also underperforming his vote share going in. So again, like in South Carolina, he came in with 62%. He ultimately won with 60%. So you can't just attribute that diminishment to undecided voters breaking in Nikki Haley's direction. The second possibility is that pollsters are getting the electorate wrong, especially because on the Democratic side, there isn't much of a competition. There's been more hype around the Republican side. So you've had a proportionally larger number of Democrats voting in Republican primaries and independent, Democratic-leaning independents mm -hmm. voting in primaries that pollsters typically polling a Republican primary they are not calling Democratic voters at all to see what they're going to do because they're just assuming, well, a Democratic voter is not going to vote in a Republican primary. That assumption may be off, and that may be part of the Trump underperformance here and the Nikki Haley relative overperformance. Um, the last one, which is the most tantalizing to um, Democrats and, and Biden supporters, is that there is actually a hidden Biden vote and that there is, you know, some secret enthusiasm for Joe Biden or secret antipathy towards Donald Trump that isn't being picked up in the polls. This is sort of akin to the like shy Trump voter theory from 2016. Mm -hmm. And what they say here, I'll just read from the piece. In this theory, the polls did well in modeling the electorate while undecided voters split between the candidates. But anti-Trump voters simply were not as likely to take surveys as pro-Trump voters. If this theory were true, true, then the general election polls might also be underestimating Mr. Biden by just as much as they've underestimated Ms. Haley. Quote, there is one reason the anti-Trump turnout might have relevance for general election polling. It's consistent with other data showing Mr. Biden with the edge among the most highly engaged voters. This could yield a slight turnout advantage even in a general election and may also mean the current polls of all registered voters slightly underestimate Mr. Biden compared with the narrower group of actual voters. And Sagar, this is something that a number of polls have found mm -hmm. is right now, this far out from the general election, pollsters are looking at all registered voters. But in the instances where they've narrowed that down to the likely voters, the voters who, are, who show up consistently election after election, Biden does a little bit better in those polls. So that's kind of the theory here is that the actual electorate is more likely to favor Biden, which, you know, makes some sense given the uh, realignment makes amongst, a lot of sense. amongst the parties and so many college educated voters who tend to be the most reliable voters year after year, election cycle after election cycle. They're the ones that reliably show up. This used to be the advantage that Republicans have. Now, with the, the electorate shifting, it seems to be an advantage that Democrats have. So that's the other theory that's out there. Yeah, the theories, I mean, I, I really don't know what to say. So back in 2020, just for context, uh, one of the things I heard all the time from the Trump people were, don't believe these polls, look at how people feel about the economy. And they were actually right in terms of how close the election was. The how I feel about the economy and who I trust more, where they had Biden and Trump tied, as opposed to Biden beating Trump by like six to seven points in many of these nationals, that ended up being a very good approximation 
approximator for the overall vote totals, even though Biden was to be able to take it up. However, what did we all learn in 2022? We apply that exact same logic where Biden is historically underwater on the economy compared to every single other modern president in a midterm. We apply the midterm lesson and we say Biden would have to overperform by more than a century. And then he almost does. Nearly right. does. True. And That's so true. what do we learn from that is that in certain instances, some social issues can trump the economy. Now, of course, there are a lot of different lower propensity voters um, who stayed at home. The high propensity people really jacked it up because of all of the abortion turnout that happened. Lots of college educated people. The Trump cope, again, I'm going to give here as well. 2024 will be more of a normal election because lower propensity voters who love Trump but don't necessarily give a shit about Mitch McConnell or anybody else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. will be coming out to vote. Yeah. I could see it in so many different ways that I, 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 in terms of my prediction, I still come back to 50-50. But I do think it's humiliating, actually, for both of them, you know, in, considering yeah, his, considering Trump's How unpopularity, are. it should be runaway. It should be so, so easy. Considering Biden's age, he should be beaten, he should be, you know, beating him by 55-45 or something like that. So the fact that it is 50-50, I think is not good yeah. uh, for either of these people. Well, this was basically the case uh, Ryan Gerdusky was making yeah. to us when he was here about how Republicans, uh, not Trump specifically in the primaries, but Republicans in these special elections, why they're doing so poorly. And it's because the white, affluent, college-educated suburban vote is so heavily Democratic now, and they're showing up for all these elections— And that since, you know, Republicans have chased all these, you know, weird conspiracy rabbit holes that are like disconnected from the interests of that population and make them sort of like and just are like an instant turn off to a lot of normies in that population, that it has led to disaster Mm -hmm. and abortion being, you know, the primary issue where Republicans have really put themselves out on a fringe extremist position that is abhorrent to not just that group of voters, but really the overwhelming majority of Americans. But he thinks that that is a very different story in a special election versus a general election, because obviously you have more people turn out in a general election. And so those people who are the low propensity voters, maybe they're motivated, maybe they come out, maybe that erases this advantage that Democrats have had in the special elections. I genuinely don't know. I mean, if I had to guess, it's probably like a combination of all of these three things that he floats here. All of them make some sense to me. You know, it does seem there's some data to back up that undecideds have been breaking towards Nikki Haley. There is data to back up that Democrats are making a larger, up a larger percentage of the electorate in these primaries than pollsters are really anticipating. And so there's sort of like this built-in inaccurate electorate that they're polling on. But I do also think that um, the data surrounding the fact that likely voters have a, you know, Biden gets a slightly more favorable outcome when you limit the universe to those people who are most likely to actually show up in an election, it does sort of indicate that there's something going on there as well. Actually, put up the third element here, and we can show you this um, sort of underscores some of the points you're making, Sagar, about mm-hmm. specifically Joe Biden's weakness. So this is the latest Gallup poll. His approval has now edged down to 38 percent. That is three points uh, th- that is three points lower than the last reading. It's <laughs> one point shy of his all-time low. And um, this person also says, accurately, well below the 50% threshold that has typically led to re-election for incumbents. Um, I took note, though, too, Sagar, of mm-hmm. the specifics on his approval rating on various aspects of the job. So he actually gets the highest rating. I mean, this is not a yeah. great number, but on the situation in Ukraine, he gets a 40% approval. What was noteworthy to me is that his handling, his unconditional support of Israel, his handling of what they describe as the situation in the Middle East between the Israelis and Palestinians, now nearly as poorly rated as his handling of immigration, Mm -hmm. which has long been, I mean, his handling of immigration has now long been one of the low points in terms of public perception of how he is doing in the presidency. So I thought that was quite noteworthy because, you know, a Across the first of all, I mean, he's dramatically at odds with the Democratic base in terms of what they want to see when you have 50 percent of Democrats saying this is a genocide. You are very much at odds. But you have a majority. There was a poll that just came out. There's a majority of all religious groups who support a ceasefire. And then you have people on the other extreme who think that, oh, actually, we should be doing even more somehow for Israel. I don't even know how that's possible. But you do have this rhetoric on the right as well of like, oh, he's not doing enough to back Israel. And even this little hand ring behind the scenes is like, he shouldn't be doing that. He should just be saying, go and kill the bad guys. Um, so 
that has become a major, major problem for him in terms of facing re-election. Yeah, I think it's certainly true. You can definitely look at that. I would combine the economic number, immigration being very low. He basically is just being hit at all sides from everybody, which is very, very uh, uh, problematic. Hey guys, if you like that video, go to breakingpoints.com, become a premium subscriber and help us build the best independent media organization on the planet. That's right, we're subscriber funded, we're building something new. We wanna replace these failing mainstream media organizations. So again, to subscribe, it's breaking points.com.